that it is time to, in a certain way, wave goodbye to the 17th century. And I thought it might be worth letting Robert Hooke do it. So here's what he had to say in 1692. He wrote a major set of essays and books called, in fact, it had a, uh, a section called Microscopium, which is a little more confusing. But anyway, <clears throat> in it, he reviewed a lot of material that he had done earlier, and then has this rather sad statement, which I'll try to read. And he says, the use of the microscope is now reduced almost to a single votary, single person, who is Mr. Leeuwenhoek, besides whom I hear of none that make any use of that instrument, but for diversion and pastime. So why did this happen? What had happened? The early pioneers were gone sort of off the stage. And among, this is not by Hook, this is from the writer, uh, Stephen Inwood, who says, it was believed there was nothing left to discover or that what there was would be, would bring no profit. The idea that Leeuwenhoek was working virtually alone was not for want of materials to discover, but for want, and this is Hook being grumpy, as we may recall, he's always described as being grumpy, for want of the inquisitive genius of the present age. In other words, all the early guys knew what they were doing. Now everyone has kind of lost the spirit. So Hook, it says, has an int this is a going back again to Inwood. Hook was unusual in that he actually used his natural science, his, his uh, what is called here natural philosophy, as a way of making a living. He is one of the first people who wasn't independently wealthy when they got into this enterprise. And he actually started this thing as a way of making some money for himself. And so he felt that it was, he was legitimately able to condemn what he saw as a whole generation of people that really were more interested in money than in knowledge. And he says, all other notions are, notions are insipid with them. But he did sort of believe that ultimately knowledge and natural philosophy would triumph in the end. And saying, finally, there's a real beauty and allurement in truth that will produce some people even in the worst of times. And they'll shine out and dispel, dispel the clouds of error that encompass it. Well, that's both pessimism and optimism in the same sort of perspective. But remember, this is at the end of the 17th century when the work with Newton was coming out, when his own field was in some ways contracting. He was much more tied up with the building, with the construction uh, work that was going on and doing much less and hoping that other people would come up with interesting things to do in the microscope. And sadly, there wasn't an awful lot during the 18th century. And there are a couple of reasons for it. First, I'll show you though, well, no, I'll put it this way. These are, this is an example to show you that this stuff was really going on, that there were people making microscopes during the 18th century. This is a collection of 18th century microscopes. And all sorts of things were being made. And you can see that some of them are really quite elaborate. Things, this is the sort of basic microscope here, this one came with a little drawer in which you would put the sample, your various samples, and a single a double lens with some sort of little reflecting device so that you could get some light in it. This is, there's a mirror down at the bottom here, okay? And this would be something to either manipulate a sample or to focus some light on it. There were a number of things, and you can see that the interest in making these became almost ornamental, right? Things like this that had all these beautiful carvings and 
elaborate wood on the sides, various things. Some of them had ivory in them, okay? And not to mention that there weren't people who were trying to do more exciting things. Like this is a simple microscope. Remember a sin single lens microscope and a rotating nose piece, the equivalent of what we now have on our microscopes today that you could move into place to change the way you were looking at your sample. And then one more interesting example, this device, which is called a solar microscope, was designed to be screwed into the, sort of screwed into a window or attached into a window with a mirror that was designed to capture the sun, sunlight, and direct the sunlight through this thing to the wall. And then there would be an image on the wall, projected on the wall through this microscope. So you could, you could have parties and invite, invite, invite people to see what you were showing. And then I couldn't resist including this extraordinary bit of carved silver that apparently belonged to King George III in England, made out of silver and clearly not so useful as a microscope. Although there are places where you can see, say here is sort of a condensing lens. And once again, the eyepiece at the top. But clearly you've got a lot of other folk involved in this device. It's really quite an extraordinary piece of apparatus. So I was very amused by it, compared, say, to the one over here, which is basically a, a kind of a pocket microscope, a little box. They actually referred to it as a toy microscope. Now, all of these images came from this microscopy website, which is micro magnet FSU edu. And it's under the collection. If you search for 18th century microscopes, this is the sort of stuff you will come up against. It's really quite, quite a collection. And I've only given you a small segment of it. Then there'll be another segment on 19th century microscopes, which are quite, quite different as you'll see uh, when we get a little bit more into them. So why did this happen? Why were these, these things were basically sort of parlor toys. They were things to have in, around for entertainment when, you know, when Facebook was down or, or other things were not available. You could always have one of these things available and sort of poke around in it and see what you could see. But there were issues, serious issues, not only issues about, well, this is no longer very interesting, there were other things. We still had, at this time, these serious problems of both chromatic and spherical aberration, which meant that what you could see through these microscopes was actually fairly limited, especially if you were using the sorts of scopes, most of which were in that image, which were two lens, multiple lens microscopes, sort of like the, uh, the ones that Robert Hooke used. And remember what Robert Hooke said was that he had, he used those two lens microscopes because they were a lot easier on the eyes. And not only that, they were easier to make. The difficulty with those lens microscopes, however, is that their total magnification was really quite low. They were very good for looking at insects. And, you know, if you really pushed them, you might be able to see say the structure in a piece of cork, but you couldn't see much more than that. And it was only with the sorts of microscopes that von Leeuwenhoek used, the single lens microscopes, that you could get enough resolution to really see detail. Because with a single lens microscope, the aberrations were reduced by a factor of at least two, right, for each chromatic aberration from one lens, you now didn't have the aberration from the second lens. Same thing for spherical aberration. 
And the other point, which we really haven't gone into in the optics, is that the way you reduce spherical aberration in its simplest form is to use the center of the lens. And so once again, in order to do that, you'd have to have a small lens and get your eye very, very close to it. So there were those kinds of issues that made the single lens microscopes rather difficult to work with. We'll see some examples when we get to the uh, early 19th century. But those are problems. The other issue was how to prepare tissues. There was no good way, no standard way, to get samples thin enough that you could get light to go through them. So a lot of what you saw was surface images. That's why a lot of those insect images were so dramatic, because they were really seen by reflected light, not by transmitted light. And the only example, well, the best example of the transmitted light image was the cork slice that Hook had developed. And what he did there in order to see it, see if I can draw you a kind of a picture. If this is a piece of cork, and remember cork is a bark. So you start with a piece of cork that looks like this. And the cells that are in it, I'll give you a side view first. Are sort of stacked in that material. So what Hook did was he cut a diagonal through this thing. Here's where my artistic skills fall apart. Okay, so that what he ended up with then, if I can now erase some of these lines. What he ended up with, you see, was a very thin sliver of, um, of material in sort of in this region at the very edge. But you had to be very careful if you looked at that. See, so now you would see the cells up here. But this whole thing was very fragile and would fall apart. So it took great skill in a simple kind of dissection to see anything. And then imagine the work that you had to do, that people like Swammerdam had to do to get those detailed images of the insides of insects. So specimen preparation was difficult. And what one did to, ac to accommodate this was that the manufacturers of the microscopes of the sorts you saw in the other frame provided, the manufacturers provided a set of slides. So they were standard images of standard things, once again, for the point of entertainment, rather than for progress of science. So that's one of the possible reasons, that it was just physically difficult to continue in, this, in these studies, except you have to then ask, how come all those people in the 17th century were doing it with such energy, with such excitement? And it's because they were at that point discovering new things at just the level that they could see them. And they were discovering things like spermatozoa. They were discovering the uh, small animals, the protozoa, the small beasts, even bacteria. But once they discovered them, that was it. They were, there they were. And there wasn't an awful lot to do beyond it. And it depends on what you've looked at. What I've looked at in terms of the number of, of books that try to explain why this lack of interest developed. The other was, I may have mentioned, I did mention to you earlier in the course that people were sort of caught up in Descartes' view of, of matter, which was that matter was formed out of the accumulation of small particles. And that the arrangement of these particles said something about the way matter was organized. And that they were really 
not different kinds of particles, but that they were all essentially the same. And it was the pattern in which they assembled that made the difference to what the structures were. Well, so the hope when many people started to use microscopes, people other say than von Leeuwenhoek, who after all was just wildly curious about everything he saw. The, the underlying philosophical hope was that they'd be able to see these particles in some organized way, that they would actually be able to see these particles. And then it became clear as people did go make their effort to see higher and higher resolution, that they couldn't see them. So if you can't see them, then you just say, well, Descartes was right, and we'll just have to take that on faith. But then we're no longer interested in trying to follow it up. In a similar way, when Newton published optics, his book on optics, one of the things he made absolutely as a firm, firm statement was that chromatic aberration was built into glass and there was nothing you could do about it. That every piece of glass he looked at would disperse light like a prism and generate all the different colors. And so there was no way to get around that. That was at least what Newton had said, which meant again, What's the point? Let's just not try to push this anymore. The images are as tough as they're going to be, and that's really a problem. Okay. Huh. So for a hundred years, people didn't do a great deal of microscope work, except in that peculiar way of rich people having an having an entertainment. And that brings us somewhat indirectly, but it does. It brings us to Robert Brown, who I, I think of as in some ways sort of the beginning of a re, re interest in scientific investigation using the microscope. And he sort of stumbled into this stuff in a very, in, a, in what I think is a fascinating way. So here's what happened. He was born in Scotland, had a pretty traditional education, was obviously a very bright guy. By the time he was 20, 21, he had finished medical student, medical school, probably didn't have to go through MCATs and stuff like that in order to get in, but he was clearly a bright enough man to complete whatever their medical training was. And he immediately, became a surgeon in, a, uh, in an army group in this uh, regiment of fencibles, which was clearly a, uh, a Scottish military group. And apparently, and here the story is a little murky, but apparently what happened was the group of these soldiers with him as a surgeon, so a member of the group, went to London from Edinburgh to recruit additional people into the army. And while he was there, he met this man named Joseph Banks, Sir Joseph, Joseph Banks, who was somehow caught up with Brown's interests, with Brown's general demeanor. It turns out Banks was a botanist in the way that you know, a lot of, I guess, people were able to do at that time to collect plants, to create his own herbarium. Once again, reasonably wealthy man. So he had a large collection of plants. And in talking about it, he got, he got Brown interested in the subject and Brown clearly made an impression on him. This must have been, the claim is something like 1798. And as part of this, Banks started, got the sort of idea, started to generate an expedition to collect more plants, to go out into the world, which had now become 
increasingly available if you had the right kinds of ships and the right kinds of money. So he set up an expedition to go to Australia to collect as many plants as, as they could. And he invited Brown to join him because Brown was by that, he understood that Brown by then really did understand plants. Brown had developed his own interest in botany as well as in his interest in microscopy. And so he invited Brown to join this, this expedition. Now this may have some sort of resonances for you because it wasn't that much later that this young guy named Charles Darwin went on a trip, similar trip in a sense to South America, which was the beetle, the journey of the beetle that, that took Darwin into his new world. So the end result was that Brown came back from this trip with 4,000 separate species of plants. And Banks arranged for the, uh, the government and the museums to support Brown for Brown's looking to catalog all of these plants, to arrange them in some sort of hierarchical structure so that people could understand the family structures within them. And during this time, Brown became interested in plant fertilization. Remember, this isn't that much later than the interests in spermists and ovists at the time. And so Brown started looking at fertilization, what was then understood as fertilization in plants. And he understood that there were two components. There was the ovule and there was the pollen. And he carried out a detailed analysis first of the ovule and was able to show that in different species, different classes of plants, the gymnosperms versus the others in which uh, the ovule actually in one case has um, some sort of shell around it like this. Whereas in the other, in the gymnosperms, which is the pines and things, the ovule is somewhat naked. And so he was able to actually start to watch the growth of pollen towards, towards the egg. This uh, is an extraordinary process of plant fertilization that we're not gonna be able to talk about right now. In doing so, <clears throat> Brown took the pollen that he was looking at, just suspended it in water and looked at it in the mic with his microscope and discovered something rather unusual, okay? Which is this. People, by the way, and you'll, we'll come to it in a minute, people misunderstand what it was that he did. Pollen grains, <laughs> a little round things. Well, they're really quite small. In order to see when you, if you look at them with a, with a conventional, one of our modern microscopes, you can see the pollen grains at relatively low magnification, but you can't see anything interior with a, say a 10X length lens. But the, what, what Brown noticed was as he looked at these things, he saw small particles within the pollen grains. He describes what he can of the shape of these things saying, well, some of them ovoids, some of them are little balls, little spheres. He wasn't sure if they changed their shape because it wasn't clear. But what he did see and what he noticed very dramatically, he thought, was that all of these particles were in motion, that they were moving, even when the pollen grain itself was still. As long as there was some water around, which was, you know, he had put these things in water. As long as they were suspended in water, he could see these things moving around, but not in any particular direction. 
they were just sort of randomly moving around, small distances, okay? And he took this thing to a fair amount of extremes. What he did was he said, okay, maybe there's something special about living material. So these are plants, this is pollen, these are all living structures. So maybe that these things move around because of some sort of life force. Whatever it is that's internal to the pollen is moving these little particles around. And it's true, later on he showed that in other plants, there was a flow of things like chloroplasts and flow of material through the cells. But that's a different thing from this type of movement, okay? So he says, gee, I don't know, let's take a look at, does it have to be a living piece of pollen? So he takes some pollen and he kills it, puts it in alcohol, he dries it, he heats it, and then puts it back in water. And again, he sees these little particles moving around. And then he says, well, does it have to be from a biological material? Well, he takes a small jump and he says, let's look at some fossilized plants. They're sort of plant related, right? And when he grinds off a little bit of the material from those things, once again, if he gets it small enough and suspends it in water, he finds them moving around again. Similarly, he then goes out and collects dust and he complains that, you know, if you have any coal dust, there's a lot of coal in London. If you collect coal dust, it too moves around if you get it in water. So that this movement that he was seeing was not just a property of life, it was a property of everything. Now we now know, or we now believe that what this is, is the actual interaction of molecules of water with these very small particles that make them move in a kind of a random way. And that assumption was actually taken up by Einstein, who in sort of 1905, 1906, published a major paper based on this internal movement of of particles which had been described as Brownian motion. And I guess I should have the word up here in big text, right? Brownian. Okay. And so Einstein analyzed that and suggested, look, if it's really the interaction of molecular of molecules of sub-visible small atoms with these particles, then we can do some calculations. And he actually did a whole bunch of calculations to try to figure out if he could predict something about the activity within there. And apparently what he ended up with is saying, well, there's a constant of motion, which turns out nowadays to be thought of as the Boltzmann constant. So this observation of something relatively trivial, maybe, turns out to have profound depths, profound depth from when we finally end up talking about molecular structure and atomic structure of matter. It's really very important in that way. And anybody taking a, a reasonably advanced course in physics ends up with some lectures on Brownian motion. Brown also described something else about these plants that he was looking at. And this had nothing to do with the pollen, but what he described was a structure within every cell. So I'll show you a picture of it, but I can't resist trying to draw something, okay? So if this is what you see in the, the cells of a, of a leaf, where you see lots of cells divided up like this. 
what he saw was a little dot in each one. which he called the nucleus. He was not the first person to see these structures, but he was the first to appreciate that they were common to all of the cells that he was looking at. And he even predict, predicted that not only was it found in just these surface cells, but it was found in all the cells in the plant. That turns out, of course, to be very important later on in understanding how cells proceed, how cells duplicate what we understand now about the, the passage of information from one cell to the next. So Gran really made a couple of very interesting contributions. First, I'll just show you the paper, the beginnings of his paper, because it's kind of fun to look at. Here's the, the title of the paper is a brief account of microscopical observations made in the months of June, July, and August, 1827, on the particles contained in the pollen of plants. And, and this is the extraordinary thing, on the general existence of active molecules in organic and inorganic bodies. Okay, wow. That's, that's quite a statement. And so first thing he does in the paper, he says, and I think this is really very sweet. He says, these observations, all of which are the same, are, have all been made with a simple microscope and indeed with only the single same lens used for all of them. And then he says the focal length of it is one thirty-second of an inch. We'll see what that means in another moment. There's a footnote. And the footnote says, this is a lens I had for a long time. And after I've been looking at this material, Mr. Dolland made another microscope for him that had excellent lenses, two of which were higher power than that above mentioned. So he said, I've often used these to see what's going on, but basically in order to con be consistent in my analysis, I used uh, the same lens for all the observations that I describe here. I love the way these things have worked out, and the, the, the honesty in the way these things are put together. So what does this microscope look like? Uh, we'll get to the controversy in a minute. Here's a microscope, or here's a bunch of his microscopes. Notice what they are is single lens microscopes. Okay, the one that there's a story behind it and I'll, I'll fill it in in a minute, but there, these are several examples of existing microscopes of the type that Robert Brown used, okay? Um, the one that Brown used himself is probably this one here at the end. And you'll hear the story about that in a minute. Just to sort of remind you what the structure of that thing looks like, this is it. In other words, it's a pillar with a mirror, right? Shines light through something here, but there's no lens there. But it's something on which you mount a slide. So here's your sample. And then something you can do some poking around with, which is what this thing is. And then up here, is an eyepiece with a lens in it. This is a view from the back. It shows basically the same thing, showing that there's a way you can adjust with knobs, adjust the position of these things. It gives the thickness of this little piece 
as a millimeter. It turns out that this lens has a focal length described by Brown and a 32nd of an inch turns out to be about 0.8 millimeters. You are basically right on top of your sample when you're looking at it. I mean, this is very close to the sort of thing that von Leeuwenhoek was using, except that it's on this pretty mounting. You put your head right on top of that machine and look down on it. Focus through your eye at whatever the lens that's sitting in this small opening. So that said, here's, here's some interesting discussions that then came up. And they came about in two ways. One of them is an error that's still, still everywhere. Not a funny way to put it. If you look up, if you look up Brownian motion, say in a physics book or in most non-specialized kinds of things, it's always described as movements of pollen grains. Pollen grains are much too large, actually, to be moved by these kinds of forces. Pollen grains would be moved by almost by flow of liquid, by thermal currents within the water. But this business of this random, very small distances was not pollen grains, but actually it was, and Brown is explicit in saying, says it in the title, on the particles contained in the pollen of plants. You see? Okay. Nevertheless, the number of sources, the number of books, papers, researchers that one sees that describe Brown's work talk about him having seen the movement of pollen grains. So this is in some way, you know, just digging in the weeds for this thing. He didn't really look at pollen grains. He looked at stuff inside the pollen grains. But that raised the other issue, which is that those particles within the pollen grain were really small. And the question was, whether or not his microscope could actually resolve those particles. So there are articles from Scientific American, lots of literature in the 1950s, 1960s, even somewhat later than that, that said Brown couldn't have seen what people said he saw. Maybe he could see something in the pollen grains, but certainly not internally. Now, we have to now be introduced to an extraordinary person, to a man named Brian J. Ford. Now, Brian Ford is both a brilliant man and a real, a real challenge to understand. What he has done, he's done some remarkable microscopy work. And I have to say that first. But the other thing is that he, he's a real self-promoter. And so you can go to his website and take a look at what it is he says about himself. I don't know if I, well, I'm gonna bring up one of his websites indirectly, but basically he's really a character and he's, been a sort of a BBC authority on various things. He's given out a lecture on aquatic dinosaurs, for instance. Very charming and very interesting man. And they filmed the sequence in which they were going to do the research, which I have lectured on with this meeting and many other countries around the world, of looking through the microscope and seeing what Brown saw. And this is what the BBC had the cheek to make of our revered hero, Robert Brown. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the link 
to that video, of course, it is worth seeing. But you get the impression that he's a very dynamic speaker. He's done a lot of very basic kinds of research in the history of microscopes. He's published a paper on what people saw through the von Leeuwenhoek microscope. Remember, I showed you a video done by a man in Delft at the museum in Delft, some images through the von Leeuwenhoek microscope, except those were not done with a true Leeuwenhoek microscope. Those were actually done with a replica. Ford has dug into the history and been able to actually find a working example of a Leeuwenhoek microscope and developed a camera system to take some pictures through it. Pretty impressive. At the same time, he got interested in the work relating to Brown's studies. And so he went to what is a parallel group in London called the Linnaean Society. Let me write out their names here. Linnaean, named after Linnaeus. Okay. And the Linnaean Society was formed specifically to look at evolutionary history and the categorization of living material rather than the breadth that was in the Royal Society. And as it turns out, Brown became one of the first presidents of the Linnaean Society. Well, Ford picked up on the idea that the Linnaean Society had one of Brown's original microscopes stuffed away somewhere. According to his, his description of it, what he found was a rusted frozen piece with the gears all frozen, the lenses all filthy and horrible, the entire machine apparently quite, quite ignored from all these years, almost 100 years, but by the time he was looking at it, almost 200 years, I take it back. And so he took it upon himself to restore that microscope. And that's the microscope that shows up in this picture, the one on the right, okay? This is the one, and presumably this is the repair job that uh, Brian Ford has done with it. He then describes, Ford describes, that he used that microscope coupled to a camera without any additional lenses. I mean, he didn't do anything to enhance the imaging to see if he could duplicate the kinds of results that Brown had. And this is first one of the pictures over here is a picture of the orchid leaf. Okay, uh, let me actually take this and see if I can blow it up a little and I can move this out of the way. Okay, this is actually a pretty impressive image in any case. So what's visible in this image? And these are the important things to see. If you're a plant biologist, you already know what these things are. These are the stomata. These are the little openings, they're cellular openings. There's a sort of a pair of cells like this. Okay, two cells that enclose this little space that open and close. If from the side view of the plant, Here's the epidermis of the plant, or here's the coating at the beginning. And here's a stomate with this little opening here. And this is the way air and moisture can get into the leaf. So we're looking down on that structure and we see the stomates and we also see the cells that are underneath. So here are the cells that are in that leaf structure. And in every one of them, 
is this little structure here, which is the nucleus. Okay. That's what Brown saw as the nucleus to be able to make sense of it, okay? Now, the other image that's here, this one, comes from a, a page in his website that I will have to take you to, to take a look at. Because what this represents are little particles suspended in water the particles here are globules, I think milk globules or something very fine. I wasn't able to download this thing in a form I can show you quite properly, but here's the way it shows up in his web page. Okay, that's it. Well, I don't know what that means. Let's see if I can enlarge the page some. Okay. This is published sometime in 1992, uh, 1993, something like that. And what he is attempting to show are that these little particles that he is seeing first can be seen using Brown's microscope, but also that you could actually, if you ignore some of the jumping around, that you could actually see them moving around in this process. This image, by the way, is a GIF, unless you pronounce it GIF. It's a GIF done a long time ago and way before Facebook ever emerged, okay? But that's his image showing by direct observation, by direct sort of proof that you actually can see the kinds of particles that Brown claimed to have seen. So the idea is that Brown was one of the first then to start what I would call a renaissance of scientific study in the 19th century, still using pretty much old fashioned material. That microscope, elegant though it was, was basically like a von Leeuwenhoek microscope, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't a technical advance. Next lecture, I'm going to talk about some of the technical advances. The first, the set of advances that corrected finally chromatic and spherical aberration.